Hi, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Kim, um, and yes, I'll be taking the pulpit today. Um, this is not my usual voice. Uh, I told my husband I sound a bit like Miley Cyrus, um, but no, I'm not going to buy my own flowers. So, <laughs> yes. So today, um, the topic of my sermon is lessons in transition, um, and I'm really excited to bring this topic because normally every every year, you know, we kind of know when we are scheduled to to preach, right? And we we prepare. And normally, like just before, two weeks before then, you know, you really get into the grind of preparing your sermon and everything. But this sermon was, um, you know, even before I even started really preparing, like I think two months before about so, I already got the download of God. So normally, right, like towards the last minute, we'll be like, I want to preach, I want to preach. But this was one of the good ones where, you know, God gave me the sermon very early on in my preparation stage. So I do believe that God wants to share something to all of us. Um, So I'm really excited to talk about today. Okay, so the topic of my sermon today is lessons in transition, and we will be reading from 2 Samuel verse 5. Now, Uh, I'm not going to bring the entire verse for you all to read everything. It's a narrative. So I will um, break it down to what exactly is 2 Samuel 5, and then we will read certain portions of verses, which I will get you all to read to help me with my voice, help me preach, right? Um, So let's just look at what 2 Samuel 5 is. Uh, If you have your Bibles, you can bring your Bibles, take it out, and turn to 2 Samuel 5 so that you can check me out, you know, while I... I'm sharing certain portions. But before we go there, let me start with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, Father, that you know you are a good God, that though I have a sore throat, it will not stop me, Father Lord, from preaching your word, Father Lord, that truly, Father Lord, just as you gave me the energy and the power to power through second service, I will be able to bring the word of God again in the third service because I know you want all of them here to hear something from you, Father Lord. So I thank you. Use me, Father Lord. Use me as your vessel. Give me focus and give me clarity of mind. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, um, so first of all, um, 2 Samuel. Let's talk about 2 Samuel, right? In the, 2 Samuel is about King David. Um, the first four portions is just very basic. It tells you that, you know, King David finally becomes king, um, and that first he starts off being king to a small tribe, king, not small tribe, uh, one tribe, which is the king, he becomes the king of Judah, which is one tribe. And then seven and a half years later, only then he becomes the king of the entire Israel, which is the rest of the 11 tribes. So the first four verses just talks about him becoming a king. And then later on, right after he becomes the king of the entire Israel, he talks about how the first thing he does is he goes and conquers Jerusalem in verse 5 to 16. And now, and as some of you are thinking like, oh, didn't Joshua conquer Jerusalem? You know, you're wondering, you go back home and read about it and go find out more. But you know, Joshua is supposed to conquer the entire promised land. But what? Jerusalem doesn't belong to the Israelites at this point of time? But apparently not. The Jebusites were still there and they had a very fortified fortress um, in Jerusalem because of its geography and its hills and valleys. And so because of that, it was at this season that right after David became king, he conquered Jerusalem, and he made it into the capital of of his uh, kingdom, right? So he conquers Jerusalem in verse 5 to 16, and then finally he conquers the Philistines in the last few uh, verses. Now, it's exciting to see because, you know, for it's it's kind of a milestone, right, for for Jerusalem to be taken because you you would imagine that, you know, that the Israelites already conquered uh, Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is such an important place, and it's only when King David comes that he takes over Jerusalem and makes it his capital and eventually calls it the city of David. And for the Philistines, you know, it's not just any other enemy, right? This is the same enemy that just killed, um, well, he didn't kill, but it was in, in the battle with the Philistines that King Saul, the king of Israel, lost his life. So this is like fierce enemy, right? Philistines. But just in a few chapters later, you hear that David conquers the Philistines. Amen? So that's the story of 2 Samuel verse 5. And, you know, even as we hear about David going through his transition from a shepherd boy who plays the harp um, all the way to he actually, you know, fights Goliath and all the way to he actually becomes king, it's actually quite 
a season of time of him transiting. And so even as we learn about how, what was the transition of David like as a king, I thought maybe we could learn some lessons as well. And that's why today's title is Lessons in Transition. And I feel like, you know, for all of us, right, I mean, obviously we know SIBKL is going through a transition or is going to, you know, on 7 and 7, we're going to celebrate our 30th anniversary as well as there's going to be the official handover. There's going to be a transition of leadership, right? And I think for some of us, we're like, oh, you know, it's, uh, you know I'm going to be involved. I'm going to be a part of this. Or some of us, we'll be like, oh, you know, it's them transiting, it, you know, it doesn't affect me. But I do believe that not just that SIBKL is a season of transition. I do believe personally, each one of you are also going through some form of transition. And I look at this whole room, I scan, and I dare to say that every single one of us here goes through transition. What do I mean? First of all, all of us here started off as babies, right? We all started off as babies. Anyone did start off as a baby? Everybody started off as a baby, didn't stay as a baby. You transited from a baby to a toddler to a child, teenager, and then young adults and young families, and then adults and then golden eagles. So all of us go through some sort of, you know, transition. And those are like the natural progression of life, right? So you go through transition because of age, right? But there are also different reasons why we may go through transition. For instance, maybe a change of location. Maybe some of you have just migrated, uh, you know, from outstation, from overseas, and maybe SIBKL is even new to you. You're new to KL, you're new to Malaysia. So it's a transition for you as well. Or maybe you're in a new job. You know, when you get into a new job, new, new portfolio, new job description, a lot of things change and you're in transition. So I dare say um, everybody here is going through transition. And sometimes you may not go through transition, but because others go through transition, you're involved. What do I mean like that? What do I mean by that? Like, for instance, if you are a parent and you have a child, and your child gets married and they now have kids, you then transition to become a grandparent. How many of you here are grandparents? Any grandparents? Well, you are also in transition, okay? That, that, you know, when you become a grandparent, you know, you think that, oh, you know, I just became a grandparent. But there's a transition for you as well. You have to learn, what is it like to take care of young kids anymore at this age? How do I survive my children now? You know, and and, and how, how, how much should I tell my children how to take care of the kids? Or how much space should I give my, my daughter-in-law and my children? So as you become a grandparent, there's new things that you need to learn as well. So transition happens to everybody, whether directly or indirectly. But then, um, even as we learn about David, you know, King David, the lessons that I felt that we could pull from even learning of how he went through transition is three lessons. The three lessons that I felt that we can learn from David's transition is that, first of all, transition takes time. Let's just put it there. Transition takes time. And I would dare say all transition will have some measure of testings. I put it as a plural S because I, it's not just one-time test, it's testings, a collection of tests. And I also do believe that in all transition, there needs to be a measure of trust, all right? Time, testings, trust, okay? First of all, I go to the time. Now, I know a lot of people, when they think of transition, they think it's a fixed point in time, you know, that one time, 7-7, oh, seven, seven, we hand over, transition, a base. End of story. No, actually, it's a process. It's a duration of time. You know, it's not just a fixed point of time. Because in transition, there is a change. There is the pre-transition, and then there's the post-transition. And this whole process is transition. So I would say that SIBKL right now is going through transition. We have not transited yet, but we are in the pre-transition. There's something going on, which means we are already in transition, just in case you didn't know. Now, let's read 2 Samuel 5, verse 3 to 5. I'm going to get you all to read and help me preach. Um, shall we all read? read this together? Right? One, two, three. And he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. 
and in Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Now, you know, a lot of times we say, oh, King David became king at 30 years old, yeah. But actually, sometimes we don't realize that, yes, he became king at 30 years old. But it was only seven and a half years later before he actually fully, fully became king over the entire Israel. So when he became king, it was just to the tribe of Judah. It was just one tribe. And there was still another 11 tribe. And while this is all going on, there was still another king that was King Saul's heir, which is Ishbosheth. So actually, while he was being king, there was also another king on the throne. And for David, it took so many years, right? It took long. So how long was David's transition? How long did it take for David? Now, from the time David was anointed as king by the prophet Samuel, he was about less than 20 years old. Now, commentators say that he was during his youth, so some people say, you know, 12 to, to all the way to 15 to 17. But what we know is at least that he's definitely less than 20 years old when he was anointed as king. Because obviously at that time when he was anointed, he hadn't fought Goliath. He hadn't fought Goliath, which means at that time, Goliath, yeah, the fact that he wasn't in the army, which in that time, the army age was 20 years old, which definitely means he's definitely less than 20 years old. He wasn't even fighting Goliath then. He wasn't even in the army yet. And yet... Samuel came to anoint him and tell him, you're going to be king in front of all his family members. That was less than 20, just a young boy. And see how long it took, at least more than 10 years before he even became king in, in, in Hebron, in Judah. And even so, not everybody accepted him. And then only much, much later, when he's 37, from 20, less than 20 to 37, I think that's over 20 over years before he fully became king. And I know a lot of people, wow, you know, you can't do the math right. So many years. And sometimes a lot of us, we, we go through a lot of transition and we think, ah, oh, yeah, transition should take like two months, three months. And we decide how long transition should take. But, you know, this is biblical history in a sense that God's not in a rush sometimes. We are in a rush to transit, but God's not. And God has a preparation time. And for David, it took so long, 20 plus years. But you know, sometimes for some of us, we are not very patient. We're not patient with ourselves. We're not patient with others. You know, how many of you, um, you know, when a new government was elected, and then the first thing you do is check out, oh, what did they do? What are the changes they make? Uh? And it's, nothing's changing. They're not improving our economy. And we have all kinds of things to say about it. And we expect the government, a new government to, you know, start and, and make major progresses and everything, right? And a lot of us, we have these expectations. And some of us even have these expectations over ourselves. And sometimes we can be very unkind to ourselves. Now, you know I'm a pastor to young, young families, right? So I deal a lot with young mothers. And, and it's, it's quite a scary because a lot of young mothers that I deal, they are maybe young moms of one-year-old or maybe six-month-old baby, and they tell me, I'm such a horrible mom. I don't have enough milk to give my child. And they, they go through this kind of cycle of uh, mom guilt, and they think, I'm just, I, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I, I'm really overwhelmed with motherhood. And I'm, I tell them, you know, like, wow, you know, you're just a mom of one year. You, you know, there's no manual on how to parent your child, right? There's no proper men will tell you what to do, this is what you do and everything. You have to learn everything. And so, you know, be, be kind to yourself. You know, you've only been a mom for one year. You have a whole lifetime to learn how to be a parent. And so sometimes we're not very kind to ourselves and we're also not very kind to others because we impose expectations on others. And when we do that, we do not give time for people to grow. We do not give time for people to make mistakes. And sometimes people, you know, when they transit, they feel like, wow, I cannot make any mistakes, right? You know, I have to get it right the very first time. But you are in transition. There is always a place to learn because it is a process. And sometimes we forget and we're not patient with others and we're not patient with ourselves. And we, you know, we just think that transition has happened. It should happen. It should, we should push through. But sometimes we have to be a little patient. Because like I said, transition is a process. It takes time. Sometimes it takes a very long time. For David, it took about 20 years. But also because it's a process, there's a lot of things to learn, a lot of things to relearn, and there's a lot of things to unlearn as well. 
you know, every season of life, there is change, right? A mom that is taking care of a teenager, she can't use the same parenting skills she did with a baby. It's very different. Not that one season is better than the other. It's just different. And because of that, you cannot go in with the same skills you had yesteryears and assume that what worked before is going to work now. So it takes time, and sometimes we forget that there is a season of learning, relearning, and we don't give ourselves that space to do that. But I just want to submit to you that transition takes time, and it's not for us to decide how long it takes. Sometimes it takes longer because it's different people, and sometimes because it's a major transition, I believe it will take even a longer time to slowly transit. But apart from just transition because of time, transition also takes um, some testing, you know. Um, in every transition, there is always testing. Now, time itself is a form of test, if you didn't know. Like for David, right, imagine being told you're going to be king at such a young age. And instead of being king, he's now being chased by King Saul, and he's running for his life, and he has to act all mad and everything. He's probably thinking to himself, like, true or not, am I really going to be king, right? And, and I, I don't know, maybe at that time when he was, he, he, became, he was told that he was going to be king, it seemed very nice, right? Very, very good, wow, I'm the king, you know, I'm going to be king. But after a while, he realized that it's not going to be as easy as he thought. Because every transition, there will always be testings. And even for King David, there were lots and lots of testings. So remember I said that David became king of Judah in Hebron in, 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 when he was 30 years old. And it's only when he was 37 did he become the king over the entire Israel, right? The real king over everything. So what happened in those seven years? Why, why didn't he just become king you know, straight away, you know, what happened in those seven years? In those seven years, it was not easy for David because it was a time of civil unrest. It was the time where the house of David and the house of Saul were fighting. And, and you're like, what? Saul, is not even, he, Saul has already been killed, right? So now David, that's why he's the king of Judah, right? But yet, they're still fighting. The house of Saul and the house of David still fighting. And you know, sometimes it's like, it's not even Saul fighting David, right? It's not even that. It wasn't even Saul's heir, Ishbosheth, fighting David. It was actually Abner, which was, uh, you know, the commander of Saul, and it was Joab, the commander of David, that were fighting. And sometimes testings can come internally from within the camp. Sometimes we think testings is, oh, bad things that happen, you know, Satan is out to get me or whatever, but sometimes testings can happen inside the camp. And it's like, you know, for seven and a half years, the house of Saul and the house of David were fighting. And, you know, I searched through the Bible. I was like, you know, what happened to David uh, in that seven years? Uh, did he do anything? Did he accomplish anything in the seven years, right? He just became king, right? Sure, very, very, you know, gung-ho. Sure, very, very spirit of fire to, you know, move Israel up, right? But nothing happened. The only thing I read in that whole seven years that he did was have many babies, you know, if you read it, right, wow, there's so many concubines and all the children that were born to him. That's all he did for seven and a half years. I believe it's because it was really a time of all the infighting that he could not move forward, that, 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 that there was such chaos and there was so, so much battle, you know, within the house. And, and it's not even them fighting each other, it's their people that are fighting amongst themselves. And so it's really sad, and it almost took like seven years. He waited so long to be king, and now he has to wait another seven and a half years. But I believe that truly it was a test of even him knowing that, you know, if I really wanted to be king, I'd just kill the other side, lah. just take over once and for all. Lah. But no, he waited. He let God's timing come. And I believe that's a form of testing that David had to go through. And then we hear again another form of testing. Everybody, let's read 2 Samuel 5, verse 6. One, two, three, go. Another sort of testing comes in the voice of someone taunting you and making you feel very small. You know, King David had just, just the context of this, it's a, this part where he just became king over the entire Israel, right? Finally, finally, he's finally king, right? 
And then he tries to go to Jerusalem to set up his capital there because, you know, he needs a neutral ground, right? It does not belong to the King Saul or King David at that point of time. So he goes to this neutral ground, Jerusalem, and he wants to set his capital there. And then the enemies, right? They obviously didn't get the memo that, you know, King David is like the king of all, all the tribes right now. And they say to him, you know, even the blind and lame also cannot ward you off. You know, it's sometimes, you know, we read this, the taunt of the enemy, the voice of the enemy sometimes becomes the voice of someone going through transition. You know, transition is a very delicate, a very vulnerable stage. And so sometimes, you know, instead of, you know, charging forward, he's king, he's, he should be confident in everything, but yet the Jebusites, they were, they were making, making small of his kingship, of his leadership, and it's so easy for King David, right? He's like, yala, it took so long for me, for them to accept me as king of Judah. Now, another seven and a half years, also not sure whether the people really accept me as their king. He's still going through these things. And can you imagine the people somehow add on, you know, blind and lame also cannot. You know, it really takes a kick on his own self-esteem and all that. But you know, the good thing about David is he did not depend on himself, but instead, because he trusted in the Lord, you know, he went on. He didn't care what the, the, the Jebusites would say. He actually conquered Jerusalem. And it's a big milestone, I told you, right? Jerusalem is where the temple is built. Jerusalem, we hear so much about Jerusalem. And it's only now that they take over Jerusalem. And sometimes the voice of the enemy may make you feel very small. So much so that you can't transit to the next phase. You know, sometimes people look at transition as I have no choice, only have to transit, or transition is I am bad, not so good. Lah. But actually, I would like to propose that actually transition just means that you're living. It means you're progressing. It means that you're growing. It means that you're moving to another stage of your life. It means that there is growth. So transition is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. But you know, sometimes even in that season of going trans of transiting, sometimes the testings can come in making you feel very small and very insecure. And then we shrink back. And instead of transitioning and going through a breakthrough, we don't want to transit and we just stay where we are. But praise the Lord because David says, you know what? Go, we're going to fight the Jebusites and they managed to get rid of the Jebusites, I believe, once and for all because that Jerusalem grew stronger and stronger and that became the capital of his big city. His big, it became the city of David, all right, Jerusalem. So that's just a very good thing to see that, you know, even though you may hear the enemy telling you that you are not good enough, blind and lame also can, can do it, but don't let the enemy's voice become louder than the voice of the Lord. Amen? Amen? And then, you know, later, David's testings didn't stop. You see, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over David, Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Wow, these Philistines are really no, 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 no mercy, you know. The minute they hear a new king, wow, oh, we should attack. Because you know why? New king, most vulnerable. Let's go, let's attack him. And sometimes the enemy of God does not want for you to transcend. It does not want something good, does not want to see you go through that breakthrough. And so the enemy of God will come in your direction in full force because it does not want you to meet your destiny. You know, the promised land, it was the Abrahamic covenant, right? Gave you the whole promised land. And, you know, thankfully that David went and conquered Jerusalem and he didn't just stay there and he went. Even though the Philistines came to him in full force, he didn't retreat. He went down the stronghold. I praise the Lord for David for his courage, right? And in, in this, so he actually, it was actually the opportunity for him to actually now get rid of the Philistines. The Philistines, remember I told you the king, they killed King Saul prior, and now King David has the opportunity to kill them and get rid of them. They have been bugging Israel all throughout the nation's time, and now he's finally, they are coming at his door. And sometimes when we go through transition, you find that there might be challenges, that the enemy will be even stronger to come after you. And, you know, sometimes you, we worry, and, and, and maybe the, the enemy is just waiting for you to give up. But you're not meant to give up. You're meant to go strong and go because you're meant to transit because there is something else that God wants for you. And so, 
you know, it's not just David that went into testings. Do you know that Jesus also was tested? Do you know that before Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30, before he began his ministry, he was actually taken by the Spirit of the Lord to the wilderness to be tested by Satan. By the Spirit of the Lord brought him to be tested by Satan. If Jesus is tested, one more us, right? What, what do we expect, right? If Jesus himself is tested, I believe the enemy will want to test. And we look at all the names, this great man of God, like Moses. Wow, Moses had it real bad. Like when Moses, right, first of all, 40 years, he, he, you know, he was in the wilderness in a, in a tending sheep because, you know, Pharaoh and him had a beef. And then after that, another 40 years, he had to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. And you know, the 40 years, it wasn't smooth. If you read about Moses' time when he was the leader, do you know how many times the people grumbled against him? Even his own brother and sister, Miriam and Aaron was like, are you sure God speaks only through you? Like, are you so power crazy? Yeah, it's, you, it's only you, is it? And he had so much opposition. The people grumbled, ah, yeah, you know, you don't give us enough of quail meat, ah, not enough food, lah, rita, eat. don't give us enough, not enough water, complain. All the time they complain to him. And, they, you know, they, the kind of testings that Moses went through. And it's not even Moses decided to become the leader of Jews. You know. It was God that made, told him, go and speak to Pharaoh. In fact, if you read about it, Moses was like, no, la, don't send me. La. You know, I stutter a lot. I'm not, well, I'm, don't make me. La. Send someone else. Send Aaron. Send Aaron. And, and God, you know, God says, no, you go because, you know, I've, I will go with you. And if you read in the Bible, it's kind of the few times where God is actually angry. He was angry at Moses because Moses refused to go. And sometimes we don't realize that sometimes we, you know, we, we're very humble. No la, not me la, not good la, don't send me la, don't make me leader la. If we don't realize that God asks us to go, you better go. Otherwise God can be angry. And that's what happened to Moses. He had his testings. And enough to say, Joseph also he had his testings. We know Joseph, very young. He had a dream. He knew he was going to be someone great. But you know what? Then his brother sold him to slavery, and then after that, he ended up being framed by somebody's wife, and then he ended up in jail. <sighs> so much testings before he became the prime minister of Egypt. And of course, we know Abraham. He got tested, you know, to leave his hometown, to leave to go somewhere he doesn't know, leave his family. And then he also had to, you know, was tested with his, to whether he was willing to give up his one and only son. All these great men went through testings. How are you being tested? You know, sometimes we look at testings and we're like, oh, you know, I'm going through a bad season of testing, you know, it's just not a good time for me. But maybe you're going through testings because you're at the brink of transiting to something great. You're in the brink of transiting. And sometimes you don't even know how far along this testing will be and you do not know what's at the next stage of your life. And so sometimes you're being tested because God wants to take you to another level to not the level you used to be. He wants to take you further like before. And so sometimes when you're testing, don't give up because it might be in the great scheme of God's good plans for you that it is part of your transition to something good. Amen? Amen. So we are being tested, just like great men of God, right? So everybody, transition takes time. Repeat after me, transition takes time. Transitions have testings. And transition takes trust, okay? Trust. You know, you need a certain amount of trust in transition. Now, when I was younger and I, I was a little bit more fit, okay, way more fit, I did a bit of rock climbing. Um, and I remember when I was doing rock climbing, um, you climb up, right? And they've got these things that jut out. They're called the climbing holes. So when you first do rock climbing at the below, at the bottom, it's quite easy, right? You climb, and you're like, oh, it's actually quite good. I feel like Spider-Man, I'm climbing. And then there was a point in time when I climbed all the way up to really quite high up there. And then I realized, man, the climbing holes are not as close as it was. Now the climbing holes used to be just like, you know, I climb here, climb there, you know. The climbing hole is further up there. And in order to get up to the next climbing hole, I would have to let go and take a leap of faith up there. And I was like, when I was stuck in the wall up there, and I looked down, I was like, that's a long way to fall down. And I'm like, should I go down? I'm like now stuck halfway because I don't dare climb and let go just in case I fall. But I know that I have to let go. I have to let go so that I can 
lift, free my hands to go to the next, to the next hole, right? And so sometimes when we climb, when we go through transition, we don't want to let go because we're ah, stuck, right? And for me, it was difficult. But sometimes in transition, there must be a measure of faith to let go and trust and just go for it and take the leap of faith. But you know, in order to do that, you need, you need two things, right? First of all, you need to kind of trust that you will catch that climbing hole. But another thing that helped me and let me let go was actually because I knew I had a rope, right? So I told myself, you know, worst case scenario, you know, even if I fall down, it's okay, it's okay, I have a rope, right? What will happen, right? I'll just you know, fall a little back, right? But what would be worse if, you know, if I'm climbing all the way up and I've got friends there cheering you, like, yo, Kim, you can do it. And the more they cheer you, the more pressure you have. Now you know you cannot come back down, so you have no choice but to climb and take that leap of faith, right? Otherwise, no faith, right? No faith, right? So you actually sometimes need to take that leap of faith, right? So in every transition, because it's new, it's uncertain, you do need to take a leap of faith, especially if you want to scale greater heights. You know, if you don't want to scale greater heights, then okay, lah, just stay there lah, forever. But if you want to transit and go beyond, then you need to have that trust. And for some of us, we don't have that trust that God is for us. And because of that, we go through life sometimes holding on to what we can do, how we can do it, etc., etc. Like maybe for some of you, you're in a very bad relationship that's not good for you. But you don't want to let go of the relationship because you're not sure whether you'll find someone else better after that. Or whether, what if, what if this is as good as it gets? And then we settle. And then we get really unhappy. And, and then the relationship maybe robs you from your relationship with God. But you say, you know, I'm, I'm worried I cannot find anybody else. So you just stay on in the relationship and you never get to your next stage or your next season in life because you're stuck. Or maybe you're stuck in a job that you know is taking away time from your family and from God and from church. And it's just draining you. But you don't dare take the leap of faith because you don't know, oh, economy not so good lah. What if my skill set not so good? Maybe I won't get hired. And because all these kind of things. And we feel like, wow, we've got to protect our turf. We've got to do it. We've got to depend on ourselves. And because, because we don't trust that actually we have a Father God that is watching over us. And so sometimes even in... Life, we don't go to the next level because we really, we don't trust that it's going to be okay. And so sometimes we get stuck and instead of moving forward, we don't move forward. And let's look at David. What happened to David? Maybe I'll read this part, right? Verse one and two. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king of earth, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel. And it's like, this is the time where the 11 other tribes decide to come to David and tell him that, oh, you know, you are our own flesh and blood. I was thinking to myself, did they not realize that seven and a half years ago that he was their own flesh and blood? That was not what they were thinking. And wow, suddenly they recognized that he was the one who led Israel. Did they just suddenly wake up and realize that all the while David was with Saul, you know, he was his commander. And only later on do they recognize that it is the Lord that said to him that you will be my shepherd. That David didn't appoint himself, that God appointed him. And it's only when they recognize, I believe, that God is the one that anointed him, can there be a trust. You know, it's hard to trust people. It's hard to trust men because all men will fail us. But you've got to trust the bigger picture, the bigger God that is in control of everything. Do you know, some, sometimes I wonder, do you, do you think that God made a mistake when he anointed or uh, made Saul king? I don't think God made a mistake when he made King Saul, even though King Saul had his failings and he didn't do what he was supposed to do. I think God was intentional. So sometimes it doesn't matter who, whether it's King Saul, King David, God's purpose is going to come to pass, whoever that is on the throne, because God is in control and you need to have that trust. And so you see, it's only after these people have some sort of measure of faith, not measure of faith, measure of trust, and finally accept David, could then Israel go to greater heights. Remember I told you, seven and a half years, nothing happened for Israel. It's only after these people accepted David as their king, stopped fighting among themselves, recognized David as king, 
Then you see Israel going from, from level to level. From, they were going stronger and stronger. And in fact, in the time of David and Solomon is when the kingdom of Israel is as strong as glorious days. Do you know all the, they, you know, King, King David actually took over all the land that, you know, from, from all the way to Egypt, all the way to Euphrates. He actually took so much land and it was strong and it was peaceful time for Israel because finally they decided that they will give their trust to David and became, he made him king, and then he could do his art exploits together. And you know, you know when you read this, you say, the tribes went to Israel, you just think, oh yeah, okay, the tribes went to, Israel, to David at Hebron. But do you know that actually 340,000 of our fighting men came to Hebron to see David? And you know, you read this in 1 Chronicles 12, which is actually a parallel of the story. It actually talks about David, you know, they came 340,000 fighting men, they came to David, and and they said, you know, we came here in one mind to make David king over us. One mind. Sometimes you need trust in order to have unity. Without trust, there will be no unity. There will be gossips, I, uh, this one, this one, not good, la, that, this, that, that. We have all kinds of disunity. And because of that, the house, the, king, the kingdom of Israel couldn't move forward because they were busy having the seven years of civil unrest. And so sometimes it takes a measure of trust so that there can be unity. And when there is unity, God commands his blessings and we see Israel just raise up to the next level, right? So there needs to be some sort of trust. But it's not just about trusting in man, but it's about trusting in God. And we see, praise the Lord, that David trusts the Lord. In 2 Samuel 5, 18 to 19, now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Raphaim. So David inquired of the Lord. He said, shall I go and take the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered, go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hand. Now this is the posture of David, that he trusts God. I, I almost see as if like if David was rock climbing, you know, he'd be checking on the rope. Is the rope secure? God, you're good, you're good. Okay, I can climb, I can climb, I can go. And because of that, David didn't retreat. He went forward. He could be very easily afraid because, you know, Philistines just, just got rid of the last king, right? You know, maybe he's next. He could be very, very well afraid. But instead, he inquired of the Lord and says, go, and he went and he defeated the Philistines there and then in the valley of Rephaim. And not just once, but twice, like, wow, these Philistines are really, really, uh, they're not, not afraid or so on, you know. So 2 Samuel 5, 22 to 24, it says, once more, the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Raphaim, the same place again, like as if they didn't learn their lesson the first time. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and tag them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. Now, you know, it's very interesting to see that, you know, for us sometimes when we're going through transition, okay, la, one challenge, uh, okay, la, we will ask God, God, help me, God, what should I do? But imagine if you have the same challenge over and over again. I mean, you probably think, I, I've killed the Philistines before. No problem. We just do like what we used to do. And it's good. David, not just the first time he inquired the Lord, the second time, even though it's like almost the same scenario, he still inquired of the Lord. He never gave up inquiring of the Lord. And that's why he's a man of the God's own heart. And not just that, if you look at the way God answered, he didn't answer the same way as before, right? Different, different, right? Why didn't God just, I, uh, you know God is already, God, you're already going to win. Doesn't matter how you do it. Just do the same way like before. La. Why have to wait until the, mud, the, the trees and everything? But God gave him a different strategy. You know why? Because there's no formula. Sometimes we hope and we wish there was a formula on how we do things. We used to run church this way. We're going transition now. Is there a formula on how we're going to run church in 10 to 20 years now? Is there a formula? There's no formula. There's no formula on how to transit. There's no manual and guideline. This is how you transit. This is how you go to the next phase of life. There's no manual and there's no formula because the only thing we can do is trust in the Lord. And I believe that this is really the word for SIBKL. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Remember the rope? You're not just holding on to it. You're leaning on the rope from God, the security and assurance of God that He is sovereign. 
in all your ways. Submit to Him. You're not submitting to men, you're submitting to Him. And He will make your path straight. And sometimes in transition, we can get overwhelmed by the testings and the time that it's taking because we're impatient. But God says, trust in Him. Trust in the Lord and He will make your path straight. And how many of you, you know, you have been following the story about um, Her Royal Highness Kate Middleton. How many of you followed the story? You know, they were like, oh, we didn't see her since Christmas. Something's going on. Some, something's going on, some conspiracy. Well, recently she just came out um, and she announced that she had a major abdominal surgery. And when they did a check on it, that, that it was actually cancer. Middleton, Kate Middleton, she had cancer. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, you know, she looks so healthy, so fit, so so. So gorgeous, right? And she's got three wonderful kids. And I'm sure she has the best diet, best treatment, best, best food, best health, best exercise, everything. And yet, cancer. And there's so many things in life that we just can't control. There's so many things we can't control in our lives, you know. Sometimes as parents, right, we, we hope we do the best for our, for our children, do it this way, we parent this way, make sure they eat, make sure they sleep this amount of hours. And so you still cannot control what happens to them. And even your workplace, you can spend hours and hours working like crazy, giving your entire life, and still you cannot control the economy or what's going to happen. There's so many things you can't control. And you know, I was just talking to um, my colleague, my colleague Jurina. Jurina, are you here? Jurina and Eugene. Well, Jurina is, if you're a visitor, you've probably talked to her. She's the one that says hello to all these new visitors. Now, Jurina and Eugene, they are in our church. And 220, 2016, her husband, Eugene, was diagnosed with MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a form of blood cancer. And her kids were six and nine years old. And as she told me, she was telling me what was the hardest, you know, apart from the fact that she was watching Eugene suffer in pain, she couldn't do anything. It was the fact that she had to be in the hospital almost at least four days in a week. And, and you know, her children, she says, what will happen to my children? And I was just thinking, wow, she was telling me, right, in that season when I was in the hospital so often, she said, my children, they put themselves to bed on their own. I was like, six and nine-year-old put themselves to bed on their own? I was like, wow. And she said they did their own homework in school. They never give any problems. And even they, they would leave little small notes for her, mommy, I love you, to encourage her. And they would pray for their father, Psalm 1 to 1. And they would do prayer altars for their family, for their father. They would intercede for their father. Six and nine years old. And sometimes, humanly, we look at it, it was like, wow, cancer is so horrible. It's so terrible. What happened, you know? But do you know that she told me, she said in all those years that I could not help them, she said, Father God fathered my children. Amen. And when Father God fathers your children, He will father like no other. You think you can control anything, but can you imagine the children right now? Do you know that they go, they have a cell together? You know, Eugene and Jurina, they are leading a cell. They're both cell leaders together with their children. They're together to run a cell. And Eugene and Jurina, right, they do not let the big C take over their lives. But instead, they're moving from one phase to another. She's moved into full-time ministry. And Eugene, they serve in the marriage ministry. You know, they, they do not let the testings or the difficulties in life rob them from moving and transiting to the next phase. And I always tell Jirina, you know, during time, your season of testing, you didn't understand why, but maybe He was preparing you for your next season in life to come into full time. And God knows the greater heights that He wants to have for you and your family. And I think that for some of us, you know, I don't know, you know, if King David knew that he was going to have to go through all that suffering, maybe he would not want to be king, right? Even think of the Apostle Saul, that was Apostle Paul. If he knew that he was going to go through a lot of lashing, he was going to be beheaded in Rome, maybe he also don't want to be the Apostle. But sometimes when we are going through the testings, we don't even know it's because we are in the brink of a transition. And sometimes you just think it's just testings, it's just a bad season in my life. But I believe that in all things, trust the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. Jirina said, I didn't understand why. Why it had to happen to me? My young children, what's going to happen? didn't understand, but yet she submitted to God and He made 
her path straight. And I believe that is true for even SIBKL. There will come a time, there will be testings for SIBKL. I'll say it here, there will be testings in SIBKL because there'll be a new leadership. We don't know how it runs, it's new, new leader and all these kind of things. We don't like this new leader or we like this new leader. There's a lot of things that's going through. We don't like the way things are done. And there are a lot of testings that will come. But I want to believe that the house of God, that the house of SIBKL will not be bickering for seven and a half years, but instead, Father, we pray. And I believe that we will come in one mind because Lord, it is you that is in control. It's not any man. God, you are in control. You are in control of SIBKL. From the very beginning, even when SIBKL was planted, our founders, Pastor Chu and Pastor Lee Chu, you were with them from the very beginning. You will continue to be with them because we are committed to keep and trust in you because you are the only one we can trust. There is no formula for transition, but there is only one thing we have, which is the Lord Jesus, and there is more than enough. Amen. We have the Lord Himself. We have the Lord Himself that will guide us through this entire transition. He will guide as I be care. And because of that, sometimes I know I worry with my husband, we worry, you know, we worry all the opposition and all the kind of things that's going to happen. But we say, no, we will not let the enemy make us feel small. We will not let opposition make us feel small, but we will move forward together as a house of SIB care. We will move forward so that we can win territories for the kingdom of God. It is not for SIB care per se, it's for the kingdom of God. There's so much work to be done. Isn't there so much work to be done in Malaysia? We cannot be fighting and just be worried about a little transition in this church because the church is too small. The nation needs the kingdom, the gospel, and the good news. And because of that, we will all be committed to know that we trust in you even if things are not going as it is. We trust in you, Lord Jesus. And we just thank you. And I know some of us, you know, you're like, this is a transition of the church, but you are also going your own transition. You're going through your own testing and you're in your own crossroads. And I want to encourage you to see the big picture that God is actually just want to raise you to your next level. And He's got to let you take time. You need to take time to go. And there will be testings. Yes, there will be testings, but trust in Him. Trust in the Lord because He is sovereign. And that this God is not just a powerful God that can make things happen, but He is a good God. A God that holds us in the palm of hands. A God that will send His one and only begotten Son for all of us to die on the cross. Jesus took the testings. He went up to the cross for each and every one of us because He has greater things that are yet to come. He says, greater things are yet to come. And so even if you're going through a season, don't give up and just be encouraged because you know transition is happening. You're in the brink of transition and because there is something greater that He wants for each and every one of us to take hold of. Amen.